some of the best journalists, uh, environmental and uh, journalists who specialise in air pollution from throughout Asia. So with us today we have uh, journalists from the Philippines, from China, from Indonesia, from India, from Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, so what we are going to have during this session is basically we're going to be looking at different perspectives, regional contexts uh, for the ability of journalists to be able to report on uh, air quality issues and on air pollution. The reason we're having this session is because we believe that the media is a vital ally in um, the work that we do. Not only can they inform the, the public, but they can also help shape government policy and help push us in more sustainable directions. As you're no doubt all aware, we, we have to act now to decarbonize um, our economies and our lifestyles. Uh, and for journalists to go beyond reporting just on air quality statistics and also reporting on things like the solutions and different innovations uh, is also another facet to reporting that we'd like to see explored some more as well. So uh, our journalists here today will talk about uh, some of the realities that they face, uh, the different cultural contexts, the different societal contexts, the different economic contexts that they, that they face and political contexts as well that they face uh, in being able to report accurately, honestly, and transparently on uh, air quality issues. So we'd like to thank you all and welcome, very, welcome you all to this session. Uh, our moderator today will be Kwang Wei. Uh, our panelists, if they could join us up on uh, stage now. And at the end, we will have a Q&A so we can open the floor to any questions that you might want to ask. Thank you again and enjoy the session. My name is Huang Wei and I'm the Strategic Communi Communication Officer for Energy Foundation in China. And first of all, I'd like to say I'm very happy and thrilled to be invited to join this media sharing session. Energy Foundation in China is a strategic regranting organization working in China. We have been helping China to uh, transit its energy structure to a more sustainable future in, uh, for a decade. And in the past years in our work, we have witnessed the how media uh, and public engagement helped accelerate in the policy change in China in combating air pollution uh, policies. So it's really exciting to see that more and more Asia countries and the media are joining this uh, combat. So our next uh, presenter, Ancha Mehta from Milo Strategies, a global health organization, will share more insights and stories of how media uh, from Asia countries are covering air pollution issues and joining the fight. Okay, thank you very much and thanks for having me here. I'm going to look back every few minutes so I can make eye contact with the panelists. Um, so uh, my name is Anshal, I'm from Vital Strategies. Um, she's already introduced what we do so I won't take time doing that. Essentially, I wanted to share uh, a scan that we conducted across 11 countries in South and Southeast Asia on uh, the public and media discourse on air pollution. Um, and many of the countries the journalists are from today uh, here at the panel are covered here. So for the purpose of this session, I've only filtered the results for the media scan, but we've also covered um, a scan on, uh, on uh, audience perception, which is primarily on social media. Um, so the detailed report will be launched next month, but I just have some key insights uh, to share today, which will hopefully be a, a start uh, to, the, to the engaging conversation we'll have later in this session. Um, So, um, very quickly, Idle Strategies is a nonprofit organization. We work on public health programs, primarily in uh, low and medium income countries. We work on um, tobacco control, uh, maternal health, obesity prevention. And the division I work for is environmental health, which focuses on air pollution. So why did we conduct this scan and what were our objectives for doing it? 
Um, we wanted to gain an understanding of the audience and media discourse on air pollution in Asia um, to understand what were people saying about it, what did they think about it. Um, we also wanted to identify the gaps between the public and media understanding on air pollution versus what the actual reality is. Um, and that will potentially identify and highlight areas for increased awareness and increased engagement. And then finally, we wanted to inform our strategic communications and our partners' strategic communications and campaign messaging so that we can resonate better with the audiences when we know what their level of understanding is. So what did we evaluate exactly? We looked at what were the general perceptions on air pollution, what were some of the perceived sources uh, on air pollution, what were some of the solutions that they want to see uh, as, as, as compared to exposure reduction and short-term solutions. We also looked at what was the public and media understanding of health impacts of air pollution. What did they think, um, you know, what are some of the symptoms that they're talking about and the health impacts that they're talking about. And eventually all of that fed in to um, the key recommendations and key messages that I'll take you through a little bit later. So what was the method that we followed? We scanned the last four years. We went back to 2015. And the reason for going back to 2015 is because we wanted to cover the time when there was the haze crisis in Southeast Asia. As many of you know, it was uh, a very bad, particularly bad haze season, and many countries in Southeast Asia were affected as a result of um, uh, illegal slash and burn um, uh, clearing of land in, um, in Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore. So uh, many countries were affected uh, with the transboundary haze. Um, we covered um, news articles across all of these four years through our partnership with um, Dow Jones, which is Factiva, and LexisNexis. And this let us go beyond the paywall. So we were able to not only cover online news articles, but also offline and print articles as well. And in total, we covered over 14,000 media articles in four years. Um, so a lot of reading, as you can imagine. Um, the countries that we covered in the scan, we had 11 countries across South and Southeast Asia, and we covered most of the um, popularly spoken languages in these countries. Um, and we wanted to make sure we had as much local context as we could. So there were regional um, uh, newspapers and media articles that were also included in this camp. So essentially what we did is through a partnership with our uh, social listening platform, we plugged in keywords related to air pollution in these eight languages. So keywords like haze or smog or smoke. Um, and this particular platform crawled the web for all the publicly available content related to these keywords and then automatically bucketed it into different categories or topics. So for example, if there was a combination of keywords used on air pollution plus, let's say, vehicle emissions or household cooking, it would automatically be bucketed into a source of air pollution. So that would be a media article talking about sources. Um, or if somebody was talking about energy efficient power and maybe smoke or haze or air pollution, it would automatically be bucketed under solutions. Um, so that's what was done for all of the 14,000 plus articles. And then we manually went through each of these to filter out irrelevant content and noise um, to come down to the final filtered results. Um, and those are the insights that I'm going to share. So going quickly into the results, the volume of conversations within the general perceptions category. Um, in 2015, not surprisingly, we saw a big spike in the number of conversations. That's because of the haze season, but also because towards the end of 2015, uh, the, the Delhi government uh, in India announced that they would be testing out an odd even number plate policy where cars of a certain kind of number plate would be allowed to drive on the road on certain days of the week. And, the, and that led to an increase in conversations. 2016 and 2017 saw a dip because of no big air pollution episode. And then this year, in 2018, we're seeing an increase in the number of conversations again. And this is because of a variety of reasons. Asian Games, 
um, in Jakarta has had a lot of media coverage and attribution. Even though China wasn't one of the countries we scanned, but the smog in Beijing has a lot of media coverage in other parts of the world as well. So that's gotten a lot of coverage in 2018. Um, and there's a lot of coverage in Indian media on the latest WHO report that talks about some of the big Indian cities uh, being in the top 20 uh, most polluted cities in the world. So those were, this is just to kind of introduce the results to you. Um, I realize that these are not very readable right now, but I have just put up some sample posts um, from different media and the kind of articles that were put out. Um, and, and these slides will be made available to you later, so you can look at these, and of course the report will be available next month. But these are some example news articles talking about the Asian Games in Jakarta, talking about um, the haze, as well as um, generally on air pollution. So when we look at perceived sources, um, is you see that vehicle emissions is the number, and, and, I, and I say perceived here with the stress on perceived, because this isn't necessarily what the actual sources are of air pollution in these countries. But you know, just a show of hands, how many of you are surprised at the fact that vehicle emissions is the number one source, perceived source of air pollution amongst media? And this includes the panel as well. Anybody surprised that it's vehicle emissions is number one? No? Yeah, I wasn't very surprised either. Um, the, the majority of articles that you see about air pollution actually point to vehicle emissions as the number one source. Um, not so many on fires, forest fires, man-made or natural, not so many on um, power plants. Um, and this is even more surprising because the haze was caused by man-made forest fires in 2015, but you still see vehicle emissions as the number one source. Um, you notice that this graph has uh, excluding India. Um, when we included India in this mix, the disproportionate um, uh, vehicular emissions as number one source was even more obvious with over 70% saying vehicle emissions is the number one source in India. Um, going into health impacts and symptoms, um, you see that the majority of the media articles spoke about acute or non-chronic health impacts, so breathing difficulties, respiratory issues, not so many talking about the, um, the chronic health impacts, so lung disease, heart disease, pointing to a greater need for awareness on those kind of health issues. Um, when we put a lens on children's health specifically, we saw that one in five or one in six media articles had a mention of children's health, but what was even more interesting to note was that those particular articles had a lot more engagement and a lot more traction than those that didn't mention children's health. So when we, look, when we filtered out the articles that received the most traction, most of them spoke about children's health, pointing to the fact that um, it's a great messaging hook and it's a great way to kind of capture the reader's attention uh, to highlight the issue of children. Speaking of exposure reductions and solutions, I'm, to, I'm in my last three slides. Um, so I'm gonna rush through these really quickly. Uh, speaking of exposure reductions and solutions, um, you see that in 2015 during the Hayes crisis, most people focused on immediate exposure reduction. So masks, um, air purifiers, and then over the piece of period of time, there was more discussion on longer term solutions. But having said that, um, the media articles that focused on solutions were mostly talking about presenting the government's policy or presenting what the government had just announced as opposed to proactively asking for policy change or proactively asking for a solution. And that's something that I'm sure will come up in the panel later as well. And then finally, when we looked at what these solutions were, um, this was very surprising to me. Across all of those four years, the number one solution pointed out by media on air pollution was energy efficient power. And the reason this was surprising is because it didn't come up in the sources of air pollution at all. So the sources that the media was attributing to air pollution was vehicle emission. But they spoke about get, having renewable energy or, or solar energy or climate change messaging related words as a solution to air pollution. 
So clearly that link is very commonly seen and very commonly understood between climate change and air pollution. But for some reason, not a lot of mention of industrial power plants as a big source of air pollution. And so that brings me to my final slide with which I'll leave you um, and to hear the very interesting panel discussion. The top, if I was to leave you with the big five takeaways and the big five messages at the end of this, I would say that greater awareness is required on the chronic health impacts of air pollution because not a lot of media are talking about longer term health impacts like lung or heart disease. I would say governments should be urged to develop comprehensive policies promoting clean air for health. Only 7% of all the media articles that we scan were proactively asking for a government to do something as opposed to simply presenting the government policy. News articles on air pollution should include messaging on health impacts. So when we scanned the 14,000 plus articles on air pollution, only 20% of them were actually linking air pollution and health, which was very surprising because health is a big, big um, uh, uh, part of air pollution and the impacts that we feel for air pollution. So more should link between air pollution and health. Children's health messaging is more resonant than other kinds of messaging. And then finally, media should be given access to credible and relevant data on air pollution. Rob mentioned it earlier as well, the media is a powerful ally. We see that they influence the public discourse. When they talk about vehicle emissions, we saw social media results on air vehicle pollution. When they speak about uh, climate change, you see that social media talks about climate change. Um, so media should be given access to relevant, credible information. And that's it on my part. My contact details are up there in case anyone has questions for me later. Thank you very much. It's very interesting actually to hear what uh, Ms. Mehta said about the, this year's Asia Games in Jakarta triggered another round of debate in air pollution. Because I remember that in China, the air pollution debate or like media reporting on air pollution actually started around the year of 2008 when Beijing Olympic is taking place at that time. And so, because as, as I have mentioned also, as uh, Ms. Mehta mentioned, that media reporting actually evolved quite a lot on the air pollution issue. And I believe that every panelist in this session will have their own stories and their own insights to share with us. And so um, by uh, starting the panelist uh, panel session, I would like to introduce each one of the journalists to everyone. And I have written down the names, but not in the order as you guys are sitting, so yeah. So first, the news. Mr. Hovey Severino, <laughs> uh, Senior Investigative Journalist in <coughs> GMA Network Philippines. And uh, Mr. Robin Hicks, Deputy Director of Eco Business of Di uh, Digital Media in Singapore. And Mr. Hicks, I believe you write on environment and technology uh, topics. And the Mr. Amitabh Singha, resident editor from the Indian Express, specialized in writing environment, climate, and technology topics. And Mr. Ikwan Susanto from Harian Campus, the most popular morning daily news in the Indonesia. Mr. Susanto writes on environment and ecological topics. And uh, Ms. Wang Tao, uh, editor and reporter from Southern Weekly China. Ms. Wang Tao, she actually has followed the entire public opinion evolution on air pollution in China in the past years. And uh, finally, Mr. Kam, 
Fahim Haram, Deputy Actor in Chief of Astrom Avani, the number one in house rolling TV news in Malaysia. Mr. Haram covers news and current affairs reporting. And starting, starting this session, I would like to actually, in this session, I would like to ask each one of uh, uh, the, uh, the panelists three questions. And I would like to hear your insights, your thoughts. The first one that will be uh, in your country, at what level is public awareness are about um, air pollution issues? Are they talking about health? Are they preserve uh, perception of health and the resources of the pollution? And also the solution, is the solution discussed as part of the public discourse? And maybe, I think maybe starting from my right side. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is, may I say? Okay, <laughs> I'm following the leader. Uh, uh, my name is Iguan Susanto. Uh, I'm from uh, Compass Daily newspaper, but we now uh, transform to digital also with uh, Compass.id. Maybe you can open it. Uh, uh, talking about uh, environmental issue, uh, in Indonesia actually is uh, is, is strong. Uh, uh, right for the citizen. Uh, I mean, uh, the good quality, the good environment quality is uh, part of human right in Indonesia. So uh, uh, every Indonesian have their uh, right to own their uh, uh, good quality uh, environment. Uh, but unfortunately, this is a weak in implementation. Uh, uh, the qual. Uh, from the quality of the standard of health is uh, still uh, weak and uh, uh, it's far from the ideal index uh, what international uh, 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 number uh, and then uh, as a media we have uh, uh, responsible to uh, have responsibilities to give information and uh, education to the public and including the awareness about uh, air quality issues. Uh, we usually uh, use some moment to produce news uh, uh, for public. Uh, we can use regular momentum like uh, uh, such as uh, environment, environment, environment day and zero emission day and meteorological day to uh, produce uh, uh, air pollution news. Uh, or we can use also an important agenda or events like uh, um, uh, mentioned about the uh, Asian Games in Jakarta and Palembang last month ago. Uh, Jakarta's mega city facing a challenging to reduce its air pollution index from transportation and uh, power plant surrounding. And Palembang is a big city also located near plantation uh, and pitland area, so it's also uh, changing with uh, its uh, have a threat of uh, pit fire. Other than that, we also have uh, our uh, uh, special report and in mid October last uh, last three weeks. So Compass also make a special investigative report due to air quality on used battery smelting. Uh, uh, we show to the uh, public, we go show to the reader how uh, the practice make the air quality decrease because of the, it uh, lead dust emission. Uh, we we uh, on that uh, coverage we collaborate with NGO such as KBDB, Masfuput, and uh, expert from uh, university and uh, many uh, research uh, instance. Uh, uh, organization. Uh, we we also uh, measured the uh, lead, uh, uh, level lead in, in the in the child in, on blood and hair. We we we, we test it in uh, uh, laboratory. And uh, uh, the result is astonishing because the blood consists of high level of uh, lead, almost three to five times referring to U.S. CDC. Uh, the story about uh, it's also uh, uh, very uh, touching in uh, uh, people's humanity. 
uh, I think the, the, this way, uh, like uh, compass way, is uh, uh, using uh, uh, humanity uh, thoughts to enter pu public awareness about uh, eye pollution issues. Hi. So, uh, India is at the focus of uh, a lot of international attention these days on uh, because of air pollution. Uh, media was covering air pollution even uh, earlier, but uh, since 2014 onwards, there has been a sudden very high spurt in, in, in the way uh, media has been writing about air pollution. And there was a trigger for that. Uh, the trigger was the first WHO report that came out that somehow was seen as uh, you know projecting as if New Delhi had topped Beijing as probably one of the worst polluted cities in the world. The WHO report, uh, you know, does not rank cities. It's very explicitly states it doesn't rank cities. It cannot rank cities because, you know, the data is very different, the baselines are different, the sources of data is very different. So uh, it's not an, uh, a report which ranks cities, but somehow it got projected as if uh, WHO was ranking the cities and somehow New Delhi had overtaken Beijing as probably one of the most polluted cities in the world. That led to a huge spurt in, in, in the way air pollution was covered uh, uh, in, in, the, in the newspapers, mainly those coming out of New Delhi, mainly the English language newspaper coming out of New Delhi. Uh, you know, almost every day there were like huge amount of reporting that was done. My own newspaper ran a series of uh, news stories for almost 10 days, uh, front page uh, stories almost every day uh, on uh, how Delhi, Delhi's air was getting uh, worse uh, um, every day. Simultaneously, there were a lot of other things happening which actually, uh, you know, which were a result uh, of the kind of media coverage that was happening, but it was also feeding into more and more media coverage. So a lot of uh, embassies in Delhi, for example, they showed travel advisories, not in very formal travel advisories as such, but there, there were talks that you know their employees were uh, very, very skeptical of living in Delhi, and apparently they, were, uh, they didn't want to bring their families and children to Delhi, and people were wanting to, you know. A lot of these uh, uh, schools that are run by embassies, they were actually started distributing masks and so it was a reaction of uh, those stories that were getting published in the newspapers and they in turn were prompting much more coverage uh, in the newspapers <coughs> so this this is somewhere around august september october 2014 uh, that led to a massive sort of uh, awareness levels uh, uh, in india at that point of time uh, about the way uh, air pollution was going so, you know, around that time, after that, there have been uh, uh, WHO reports have come uh, after that as well. Uh, and there, there have been a huge amount of other kinds of studies also that have come. And in each of these reports, uh, you know, the, the air quality in Delhi specifically, in India in general, has been uh, come out to be quite worse. And each, of, each one of them has been reported very, very comprehensively. So in terms of like raising awareness levels, I think it's been uh, uh, of the scale that, that has not been seen in India before. So I, I mean, 2014 was uh, certainly, uh, somewhere around August, uh, September 2014, was certainly a sort of a cutoff date uh, from where you can very distinctly see uh, a very huge spurt in, uh, in the coverage in the Indian Hi, I'm Brooklyn. I'm based in Singapore, and I write for a sustainability publication. Um, so a word on Singapore. So Singapore enjoys pretty good air. Um, it's not perfect. It's still about twice above the WHO threshold for what's considered clean air, but pretty good air. Um, but just a word on what one figure that, that jumped out from, from Unchal's presentation was, um, why aren't power plants being talked about in the press? Um, now, Singapore, I'm just looking at this panel, I think Singapore has the lowest press freedom of any country on this panel, I think. Yeah, Philippines, India. Um, why, why does that matter? Because um, uh, air pollution is only, only reported in Singapore um, when the air is bad, 
and that's about once a year when we have trans brand we had a haze pollution. Um, the rest of the year it disappears. In fact, there's been no mention of, of air pollution pretty much for the last few years because there's been no haze. Um, so why does press freedom matter? Um, a lot of very powerful Singapore-based companies are implicated in the haze pollution because they own the big palm oil plantations that are deforesting large parts of Indonesia. Um, also, Singapore has Southeast Asia's most powerful banks, DBS, UOB, um, and OCBC. These banks are funding coal, new coal-fired power stations that are planned to be built, not just now, they are planned, they're in the works right now in Indonesia and Vietnam, some of the big coal-producing countries. Um, so Singapore has a, and that has been very badly reported um, in the Singapore press. Why? Because there's very low press freedom. The same people that, that run the government also have big sway in the banks. So journalists, it's not just that there is a big censorship department that stops Singapore's journalists from writing about it, it's, it's the, the biggest problem is self-censorship. And the same company like Tomasek, which owns pretty much everything in Singapore, also owns DBS, Southeast Asia's largest bank. So press freedom, I'd say, is a big issue, although, and, and air pollution as a result gets very little coverage, and, and, and it should do. And again, just, just to finish, uh, the air is good in Singapore, but it's not perfect. And the cause is, I think, of big incineration plants. We have four, soon to be five, massive incineration plants. The way that Singapore deals with trash is to burn it. Um, it has Southeast Asia's uh, largest oil refinery just off the coast. That might contribute as well, very little traffic. Um, but nearby um, big power plants. So again, it, it's, a, it's an underreported issue. Magandang hapon sa inyo lahat. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Howie Severino. I'm uh, with the uh, GMA Network. Um, <laughs> I come from a country with a, a relatively free press, but we still don't have a lot of reporting on air pollution. Uh, we have such a politically turbulent uh, society with such a newsworthy president that uh, air pollution has a hard time uh, getting into the, breaking into the, breaking through the, all the political noise. Uh, and uh, as a documentary uh, producer and uh, broadcast journalist, uh, luckily um, uh, my stories are visual, but the challenge is uh, that constantly have to look for uh, visual angles to uh, stories that have often become normalized. Uh, even the drug war in the Philippines has become normalized. So there's a constant challenge to look for new visual angles. But because I'm a uh, visually oriented uh, journalist, I want to show, if you don't mind, I want to do a little show and tell, uh, maybe a minute or two of, uh, of a documentary that we did about air pollution, just to show you um, what we did to try to focus attention on, on the problem in the Philippines. Yeah, Daniel, can you? Yeah, it's, yeah the system here, the audio system here only, only has one channel, so you're not gonna hear my voice uh, narrating, maybe that's a better thing. Uh, but there is subtitles and you'll hear some of the scoring. residents in Manila still uh, cook using uh, this traditional fuel and it's a major source of air pollution but um, our emphasis in the story was the uh, impact on the health of the residents especially all the child laborers who are working 
in that particular livelihood and, and community. Uh, and uh, as, as Ancha mentioned, uh, one insight from her study was that um, children's health issues uh, resonate uh, a lot more than a lot of other issues. So that's what we uh, focused on. And also the health, health of the children. Okay, so that's a close up of some of the charcoal that's being produced there. All right, um, Daniel, if we can just switch real quickly to the PowerPoint. I just have a, again, I'm gonna show some images from some of our reportage as a, uh, just as a way of uh, illustrating some of these main points. All right, so uh, I produce documentaries uh, for a living, um, and occasionally I do stuff on uh, environment and uh, air pollution. It's another close-up of uh, the charcoal that's being built, uh, made, made in this particular community. More images from the, and this is a photo I took of uh, one of the children uh, who lives there. I mean, the, the children who live there, uh, it's not just a place of livelihood, it's actually a community where Thousands of people live, uh, the children and residents just walk, walk around with just soot on their skin all the time. Uh, like this child has, has a soot, that's the black stuff on his face. I mean, that's a normal, <laughs> that's how he looks normally uh, living in that, uh, in that community. And all of them are like that. So imagine what their lungs must look like. All right, so uh, when we do, when we report on the problems, we have to look for the most visceral uh, and visual angles, because there's so much news in the Philippines now, especially, uh, that, that if you just cite statistics and data, and if you just, if you just tell people what the problem is and don't show them, then uh, you're, it's not really going to, uh, it's not, people aren't going to pay attention. So just, um, again, another uh, a story I did, a uh, documentary I did on policy, this time it was on the jeepney. If you, for those of you who have uh, been to Manila, if the jeep or the Philippines, the jeepney is one of the main uh, forms of transportation. It's also one of the most polluted. Uh, traditionally, it's uh, fueled by diesel. Um, and then recently, uh, there, uh, there have been announcements to, to phase them out. Uh, well, just a little history. That's why uh, the documentary was not just about pollution, but also the cultural uh, aspect of jeeps, uh, just to attract people's attention. The history of, of the jeepney started with uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers, and it's a 1955 version of the jeepney. And this is the modern jeepney that's going to replace the traditional jeepney. As you can see, it's not as colorful, and uh, uh, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a big cultural obstacle, very, there's, a, there's a lot of sentimentality attached to the jeepney in the Philippines. So this is going to have, um, that's uh, gas, it's going to meet uh, international emission standards, it's going, it's air conditioned. It's every. It's everything that the tr traditional jeepney is not. Okay, and it's and and it's not very sentimental. <laughs> All right. So uh, we also report on grassroots solutions. I think this is also an approach that journalists um, need to take. Uh, but again, you have to you have to be visual and you have to appeal and resonate, especially uh, if you're working in television. Uh, this is a, a recent documentary I did about um, a a grassroots initiative by uh, civic organizations to distribute bicycles to public schools in remote areas so that children who live far from the schools uh, will have more access to the school because very often it's not just far to walk, it's also expensive to ride public transportation to get to their schools. So if bicycles are assigned to children, the bicycles are actually stationed in the school but assigned to children, then uh, the, the schools uh, it managed to increase their enrollment and reduce their dropout rates. And the last point I want to make, okay, here are more, uh, a couple of other photos from, from this school. Also, I like the fact that um, uh, in this bicycle program, this bike to school program, uh, there's a special emphasis on training girls and giving bicycles to girls because traditionally in the Philippines, Girls are not encouraged to bike because they're going to get dark or they're going to lose their virginity early, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of mythology uh, involved uh, with biking, but uh, this, this bike to school program. Uh, okay, finally, uh, journalists must walk the talk. Um, 
we, we shouldn't just uh, talk about um, environmental reform or environmental change and reducing pollution, but I think in our day-to-day -day lives, since especially those who come out on television, we're quite visible, and um, sometimes um, some people on television become, even, even journalists, become celebrities, and I think you have to set a good example. So uh, my, my co-anchor, I co-anchor I, uh, co a news, newscast in the middle of the day. This, the other person here with me is Tara Debit, who's, uh, who's also a documentary maker on television. We both commute by bicycle to work, and we're often seen doing this, uh, even by our colleagues and people at our network. And um, so it's not enough to be reporting on this. We have to be uh, showing um, that, we're, that we, we practice what we preach. And here I am, I, I go to lunch meetings on my bicycle, and I even went to a wedding yeah. on my bicycle. All right, thank you very much. China, and I'm so honored to be here, and I'm so honored to talk with this senior journalist in South Asia, um, and I am the only female journalist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the presentation the girl has just given us, the map of China is blank, maybe because just uh, we all write in Chinese, and we don't have ma much English version on our site, but we do have lots of reports in these years. Uh, and uh, all of you tell, talking about kid, and I so I will begin my story with a kid. In 2013 December, my nephew, who was just five years old, called me, aunt, can you tell me what PM 2.5 is? Because I coughing so much, <coughs> I cough a little. And um, I use this story as the beginning of one of my reports. In uh, that is my 25th stories about air pollution. Um, yes, even kids, everyone, nearly everyone in China knows the health impact of the air pollution, especially the PM2.5. When the air condition is not so well, they know they should wear a mask to go outside or just stay at home. And the government will take actions at the front level of AQI, the alarm from the blue, orange to the red will be taken and uh, some response like uh, vehicle control, the industrial limitation, even the children may have some holidays. So um, the awareness now is well done, but it do take a long time about this. Uh, the story of China's uh, coping with air pollution may be started from 1970s or 1980s, but it have different periods. Um, the first one may be the dust and the sandstorm, and you may know the Beijing sandstorm, and then the uh, XC rain is about SO2. And finally, in 2011, it comes to a problem of PM2.5. And also, they start, start of my career. Um, in 2011, um, why it is a turning point? Because thanks to Weibo, that is Twitter in China, and people are talking a lot, lot about air pollution. It's just like it's time, it's in the autumn, because Usually, autumn have very, very serious haze, and thanks to the uh, social media, people are talking about it, and uh, uh, traditional media like as this will follow this, and uh, there is interaction between the government and the journalists. So, and another p uh, turning point is 20, 20, 2013, in which year the Clean Air Plan, Clean Air Act plan was launched. And between these two years, I think all the anchors of air pollution, like source, health impact monitoring, have uh, energy, have been reported again and again. Uh, and after the act, the act plan was launched, people were asked another question: um, What's the result of the, these resolutions? Is it getting better? Uh, although uh, the government, central and local government, disclose the PM two point five and other. Uh, pollutants concentration each hour, and you can use easily get this number on your cell phone. Use lots of app, 
Mm, but it is difficult to con conceive people that air is getting better. You, you, you watch news these days, Beijing is catching a heavy haze now. Um, so uh, besides the, the data from government, I also interviewed NASA. Uh, and NASA, the scientists at NASA told me that the same train, yes, is getting better. Uh, even not is be better enough, and with their uh, monitoring site, monitoring data from the satellite in the sky. Uh, so um, I think maybe after uh, these years, uh, reports about air co air pollution is now is getting fewer, um, but if it's got air quality is getting better. But I think it's still a long way to go. Thank you. Hi, sorry. My name is Ken, so with that, good afternoon. Um, I guess my story is a collection of everyone else's, but I want to tell you this way. Um, I wish I brought my TV visuals. Thank you, Sabrina, for making me feel not doing my homework. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm not going to make it up. I'm also, also a talk show anchor, so um, I want to talk you through it. Because you, for you, who are our welcome visitors to this country, you have jumped in into Malaysia at the time when we're discussing about marriages. Yesterday in our parliament was reported by the deputy minister that one third of marriages failed in the first five years because of petty reasons. Wife snoring, wife eating in the car, doing laundry at night, going and all girls shopping trip and all these reasons. So I'm going to say air pollution awareness and Wedding in Malaysia is also like a marriage. The wedding night was 2015, when the haze, transboundary haze, every day, even I do not want to talk about haze, I had to talk about haze. Um, from diplomatic realm, but I have good relations with Compass. Without them, we couldn't have shown uh, the air tragedy recently. Um, but it even sparked, especially on online citizens, a diplomatic row between Malaysia and Indonesia because we're sick and tired of breathing bad air, but we're not burning it. Someone else and uh, it's coming to us. Singapore, because it's so small and they don't want to talk about it much, but um, we're a bit bigger, so we're like, how could, how could you? And, and that sparked that thing. But just like a marriage, three years on, it's like a bit of a plateau. And we'll only have spikes when there are fights, crises, issues, you know. Um, but the level of reporting is correspondingly so. Um, I guess it's a bit of, you know, like Philippines, we have many other things to talk about. And because of what happened this year in May 9, that was part of the reason. So I, you know, I subscribe a little bit to the freedom of the press, but um, but even then we're not under authoritarian rule. We still have room to play. But air pollution, I haven't seen it personally from a media reporting point of view in Malaysia to be a specific genre or subgenre of its own. It will have to come under the bigger picture of this new lease over the recent years about the fight for green and sustainability. I, I'll give you one example. Um, we love our green so much in Malaysia that even though the government before keep reporting to us that hey, we still have 56% of our land area green, but every time we see those childhood memories of ours that was green before, even though it was in the black and white photo for people old enough like me, and now they're not there anymore. The island of Langkawi, you should go there if you haven't, but when I went there in the 70s, it was green. The water was this high, now it's at my ankle. All these issues are reported together with air uh, pollution or air quality as far as I'm concerned from my uh, scope point of view. But um, just like a marriage, sometimes there's a divorce because 
I cannot talk about air quality without singling it out. But in order for me to talk about air quality, if I'm a husband, sometimes I need to know my wife's social media account and messaging and messages. But I can't have access because it's encrypted and there's a password. So it's the same thing for reporting air quality index in the country. Many of the data that I need or my team need, my editorial desk need, my fellow journalists need, they are locked in the servers of the government, of institutions. Even NGOs do not share their data freely for fear that the data will be used differently or whatever it is. And now that we got this Personal Data Protection Act, it somehow colludes to make the marriage even less harmonious. Okay, one more minute. Um, so, the analogy of marriage, I want to bring it this way in my final minute is, um, I think the hunger for the marriage to do well is dead. I think even the kids are cheering for the marriage to be okay. However, the lack of data is killing air pollution and air quality reporting because there are other sectors and topics that have more data accessible. So naturally water will flow and water wants to flow and uh, the reporting goes to these areas that have more data. And it will be very interesting now since we have a new Malaysia, new government after 61 years, one of the things being asked for is not only freedom of information, but a transparency act. For example, if there's one cent being spent of public's money, we want access to where the data goes. So I want to know how many health-related issues that have been contributed by AP. And I can't get that right now. So I asked that in the press conference just now to the guy that is representing the state of Sarawak. Even he admitted there's no data. So please do not ask us journalists and the media of where the reporting is if you guys are not helping us to get the data. Thank you. <laughs> I've actually heard a lot of common challenges that our uh, panelists are facing in your daily in Europe. Where, for instance, like uh, as one time said, like there are, there are fewer and fewer reports in China, even though the air pollution has been well taking a very high priority in environmental protection issues, and that there are other uh, panelists saying that normalizing the air quality uh, air pollution issue is a challenge when you are reporting that, and also I heard like data uh, not accessible, and I also see like there are like actions or like for instance like. Uh, missed server, sorry, Hovi, you have, uh, Hovi, okay. Okay. okay, you have already like taken one step forward of promoting uh, public accessible solutions or grassroots solutions as you mentioned to uh, battling against air pollution and also to raise the awareness. So my next question would be like, uh, what do you think like, for instance like where traditional media as the traditional media or as like TV media, do you think like it's in, in current state, there will be like more that you can do to promote air pollution issues. So what are the challenges that you're facing at this moment? And also, uh, do you think like ambient uh, air pollution issue could get a higher priority among like all the other environmental disasters or environmental issues that you're, you know, the uh, media are paying attention to? Thank you, uh, Hong. Uh, uh, actually, it's not easy for uh, uh, for uh, as a, as a public daily uh, every every day we uh, uh, news uh, to maintain an uh, environmental issue in in front page because the news is on front page uh, because uh, 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 in uh, editorial room it's it's like a political room also what is the leader uh, uh, focus or he, he or she want that's the news I mean it, that's in the front page 
if uh, our reader is not also compass but also ma many media they uh, interesting in politic or economic or social issues they will run with it uh, also in compass like just like that uh, uh, and 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 uh, uh, luckily <laughs> not luckily uh, the environmental issue will would found when uh, disaster is happen uh, that uh, my my chief editor will looking for me hey Ikwan, why this is happen please write it write it please find the solution ask the expert blah 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 and in the front page yeah luckily uh, but but uh, we cannot uh, working uh, work like that because uh, in front of the issues uh, about awareness I think it's prevent preventive is uh, more important than uh, uh, to to cure uh, the disaster uh, uh, but uh, we uh, in Compass Daily we uh, every day have uh, our special page for environmental issue uh, every day include the, the in a Sunday uh, uh, Sunday morning daily also we have uh, uh, environmental page uh, one page or half page every day uh, but uh, environmental issue is not only clean air issue is not only a uh, uh, pollutant issue or or etc because uh, so many issues like deforestation like uh, pit burning uh, illegal mining etc so we have to uh, manage it well so uh, many issues we cover uh, effectively uh, every day uh, every month or every years ah. Uh, uh, my suggestion is uh, NGO and experts. Uh, I think uh, uh, our academic have their uh, opportunities or resources to keep uh, uh, air, po uh, air pollution. This is a uh, frequently correct our page because they have report, they have paper, they have journal that possi possible that we rewrite with. Uh, uh, journalist uh, way uh, and also a creative steps are so uh, interesting for media I want to uh, tell you about uh, the good example from Surabaya city in uh, East Java this uh, the major have a good pro program uh, uh, by uh, uh, people can uh, read the bus by uh, uh, by paint it with a plastic bottle waste. So I think this is a good idea and it's interesting for uh, media to, uh, to, uh, to cover it uh, because uh, uh, it's a uh, rising awareness about the public transportation also this uh, help to clean the environment from the waste. I think uh, uh, technical uh, Technical editorial, I can do that. Thank you. Uh, in India, the situation is slightly uh, different uh, in the sense that uh, air pollution has uh, got a lot of a fair amount of coverage, uh, much more than say many other subjects uh, of probably equal priorities for the government. <coughs> so, uh, in terms of coverage. Uh, has been there. Also, the uh, problem of accessibility of data is not that great. The fact that not enough data is generated in the first place, that's definitely there. But once the data is generated, I don't think there's too much of a problem in accessing data. Uh, data interpretation might be another thing. I mean, how well the journalist is able to interpret the data. So <coughs> those things are there. But, the huge, huge amount of coverage that happened, uh, that has happened in the last three, four years, has, you know, actually led to a lot of uh, policy initiatives, a lot of uh, regulatory initiatives from the government. Lots of things uh, uh, have, lot, lots of activity has happened in the last three, four years in, in terms of tackling, trying to tackle uh, evolution. Still, the coverage in the media is slightly skewed. Uh, 
more or less, uh, you know, uh, what you see in the newspapers, uh, also on television, is there's a disproportionate amount of attention on what is happening in New Delhi. Uh, well, while New Delhi is uh, certainly probably one of the most polluted, it's not the most polluted uh, city or region uh, in the country. There are lots of other areas uh, which, no, which developed as industrial clusters in say 60s and 70s, and which have remained sort of stagnant in time in terms of technology and in terms of methods that they apply. And a lot of areas in uh, uh, in uh, India are actually would be much more polluted than uh, New Delhi is. But because New Delhi is uh, the center, it's the political center also where the major newspapers are based, there is a disproportionate amount of attention <coughs> on, on uh, New Delhi. Also the fact that, uh, you know, s some of the policy initiatives and also uh, some of the court orders even uh, seemed to focus entirely on Delhi and that I thought was quite unfortunate. You know, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, so there's an environmental court in India and a lot of its orders that came as a result of the kind of reporting that happened on air pollution seemed to be concentrated on Delhi. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of other regulatory initiatives that have uh, that are coming in, that are in the process of coming in, are, are more nationwide and we'll start seeing uh, the results in a few years. So uh, that was one thing. The other kind of skewed coverage is, is the fact that a whole lot of emphasis is on uh, stating the problem. And now we have stated the problem for the last three, four years. And uh, but the fact that your air quality is worsening, and uh, this this is the kind of health impacts that it is having. So we 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 have stated and restated the problem. We haven't got into the kind of uh, uh, we uh, the solution space. Also, we haven't got into uh, you know looking at the compliance of what. The, what exactly the government is announcing, whether there is compliance, on, and there is a very, very, very poor compliance record. So, in the sense that if you, uh, they, uh, the government actually, as a result uh, of all these campaigns in, uh, in the last four years, they came out with a lot of uh, uh, regulatory initiatives like uh, new uh, emission standards for industries were announced, new uh, construction waste and disposal waste uh, over, uh, rules were announced, and a lot of that is not being complied with. So the media focus hasn't gone there, whether you're, the things that you are trying to do, uh, the solutions that you are trying to find, whether they have been complied with or not. The third which has come out from Archil's presentation also is we are not looking at the culpability of the industries, you know, who is polluting. Uh, industry is, happens to be one of the bigger polluters and lots of industries, uh, you know, and also because they, are, they perform they have a very strong lobby. So like uh, new rules were notified for the cement industry, for example, and very stringent uh, emission standards for cement industries uh, and r &M steel uh, were notified a couple of years ago. And the cement lobby got together and they lobbied with the government. Uh, they told the government we can't actually do it because of you know uh, the access to technology and it's very expensive. So please delay it. And it's been delayed uh, because cement is very, very crucial to the overall, you know, the infrastructure that India is putting up in the last, I mean, it's the, the amount of construction that is happening in India is like huge and you cannot compromise, uh, you know, you cannot, you will have to yield to the cement lobby and those kind of things. So the media reporting hasn't gone to those kind of issues. Uh, there is a lot of attention on, you know, stating the problem all over again. Just a quick word on the, on the challenges about uh, with data, dealing with data. So, um, yeah, I think a number of journalists, myself included, sometimes find the data involved in, in air quality quite confusing. There's obviously lots of different parameters, PM10, PM2.5, then you've got nitrous oxide, all the different um, pollutants. I think journalists find that quite confusing, which to focus on, and then so therefore how to report on that. I was just talking to a chap from the EPA, last night, he said journalists in the US always get air pollutions wrong by varying degrees. Every story they usually get wrong. Um, so 
I think given given that, I think journalists sometimes find air pollution stories a little bit intimidating, don't want to approach it because it's quite academic and they find the science quite difficult to penetrate, right? Um, so, so yeah, that's data and just, just again, just inspired by um, Howie's documentary, it's just a, about how to tell good air pollution stories um, when air pollution is by and large invisible. Um, the good story is about from Singapore or when there is haze and it's a good story because visually you can see the Singapore sk skyline which is ordinarily uh, impressive cloaked and shrouded in, in a greyness that makes for a good visual story um, but how else do you do that in Singapore it's very difficult I mean you've got the sort of almost like Dickensian element of how he's storytelling these Oliver Twist like characters roaming through charcoal or, or in, uh, for instance Indonesia um, there's also a good, uh, around coal, coal plants and stuff. You don't have that in Singapore, so it's difficult to tell those visual stories. So, um, yeah, I'd say those are the, the main challenges with deep, uh, data and visual storytelling. Thank you. Uh, one uh, major criticism of journalists in general is we're so negative. Uh, we're constantly focused on bad news, on the problems. And I think... Um, it, it applies to air pollution as well. And uh, this is not a call for, to ignore those problems or to, to gloss over them. But I think um, very often journalists, uh, you know, there's a saying, uh, I don't know if it applies in other countries, but in the, in the Philippines, uh, we, we people, people taunt us by saying, uh, if it bleeds, it leads, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if it's a bloody story, then it has to be at the top of the news. Okay. Well, uh, often you know that's often the most significant news, but uh, it shouldn't be the only news. And in fact, uh, in societies or countries that have a lot of problems, maybe it's the solutions that are real news. And sometimes that's what journalists tend to gloss over. Uh, so I'm I'm a I'm a believer in traditional news and traditional coverage, but I'm also a believer in solutions journalism, in going out and looking for solutions to, to problems, especially if the problems have been reported again and again, and to the point where people feel numb and helpless and even bored by it. Sometimes the more interesting news is, is the news that uh, presents solutions uh, to kind of age-old uh, problems. So I think that's what um, I think that's that's a way to move issues forward. It's not simply to keep exposing it, exposing the problem from all kinds of angles and looking for the latest data on the problems, but also looking for solutions um, because uh, uh, solutions are being tried out there. They, they just uh, they just often don't make the news. And uh, sometimes it's not even the government that's producing the solutions. It's often communities, it's op sometimes it's individuals. Uh, and uh, I think if society is going to solve its problems, media has to do its part in presenting, or in finding those stories of hope, those stories of solutions, so that they can be emulated. They, people can be inspired by them, and people don't feel as helpless by this huge, because air pollution is such a huge problem. <laughs> no, uh, no one country or no one, one government can, can solve it, but I think everyone can feel that they're doing something about it. And if you have millions and millions of people feeling that they can, that they can help solve the problem by just working in their own little community or even in their own household, maybe there's some real hope there. Besides the monitoring data of the concentration in the uh, ambient air quality, we also know the data of the enterprise emission. Why? Because we have great, great pressure on this. And the government is not on the opposite side of the public. Everyone should grace. And there is a one uh, slogan in China, that is, breathe together and live together. So uh, even the king, it can't 
always live in a room with air purifier. Or she also wants to go outside in the park, really. So um, recently I read a book about environmental news and a professor wrote a theory that there is a cycle, the cycle to solving an environmental problem. That is the first step is the media reporting, then the public awareness, then the political attention, then the law revisement, and finally the action of enterprise. I think on the air pollution issue, the cycle is uh, almost completed in some areas in China, especially in Beijing, also the same problem of New Delhi. Uh, but it is the cycle is go back again, since we don't solve the problem um, uh, at all, yes. So uh, besides, besides places in Beijing, like uh, Western China, where the concentration is still very high and gets less attention than Beijing, this cycle is still on the way, although the environmental law has been revised in also in 2014. Uh, so uh, besides air pollution problems, other problems, I think maybe water pollution, the heavy metal pollutants and the organic pollutant and the leak of oil. <laughs> This, this environmental use is also very important and it is m more, much more local and not everyone pay attention to it. And this is my smaller cycle is based on the local government. I think uh, as part and the, especially the first step of the cycle, the journalist has a long way to go and we know that we are not alone. We can get people together because not to breathe uh, fresh air together. We have to drink clean water and to eat uh, healthy food together. So not everyone is on the opposite side, I think. Oh, about challenge, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, challenge, I think maybe mm, it's not true. challenge based, but also opportunity uh, is the social media. The interaction between social media and traditional media is very important. And we cannot call us a traditional media because we also have a lot of uh, online reports now, and the action, the interaction between this is very important. As I just uh, said in last last part, uh, the mm, uh, public get a much attention on Weibo, the Twitter in China in 2011. But the social media is pieces and is only hot when the air condition is not so good. But the traditional a uh, traditional reporter will follow the long story and to, ca to catch the train and to press the policy to policy to revise and to follow the old story. So the interaction between the social media and traditional media is very important in this cycle, I think. Thank you. Um, I think I want to go back to my memory analogy. <laughs> You also in the country, we are very hospitable and we're very open. Charlotte has more than 100 different dialects and sub-dialects, for example, and uh, diversity is key. And in this country, we allow, if you want to have polygamy, for those whose space allowed it and are able. So for me, for air quality and air pollution to get more centered in the reporting of, especially mainstream media, it has to be a polygamous marriage. It cannot stand alone. It doesn't have legs. It doesn't have enough uh, to be there on its own. Uh, I wouldn't put a, a desk just for air quality because I can't. I'm the smallest newsroom in the country. I'm one of the youngest mainstream media. We're only 10 to 11 years old, but we are punching above our weight already for New Malaysia, for example, the political stories alone. And there's this new cabinet, 90% are new ministers. But for Malaysia, my hope and my vision for the role of the media here is top leadership. A marriage sometimes needs counseling, you know, seeing the bigger picture. So that bigger picture is what the media can give to the marriage of the authorities, leadership, industry, and society. Because what are these new ministers going to do? They can't exactly follow 
their predecessors because they vilify the predecessors. They can't exactly do totally new stuff because the entrenched bureaucracy, cultural setways wouldn't allow them to. So this is the opportune moment in Malaysia, in New Malaysia, for the media to put it where it is, fill in that gap. If we do not take this opportunity today, we will forever lament the fact that we could have made substantial change. Whether it's for greenhouse gases emission, whether it's for ambient pollution fine particles, whether it's for indoor or household ones, I think it should be rejuvenated, the discussion, with new, more organized, strategic network linkages of data. You know, um, the universities, for example, I mean, why are Vibas only done in the halls of the university and being preached to the converted already? Come out here. I want to see the link between thermoplasm and thermocline in the ocean to the atmospheric conditions, to the industry emissions, to the clearing of our forest, and to new plantations, and then I can give a better picture and make sense to my audience. I agree with my colleague that sometimes the sign is frightening, but that's exactly why we do what we do. We, the media, have got to take the complex and make it easy for the grassroots and layman. But, caveat is, we can't do that without you guys. I mean, MICAS, CAA, I haven't seen all this data before. Maybe it's my fault for not going to you. But I can also ask you, in a marriage, you might also have to do the first move. Maybe if you had bring me lingeries, then I would be interested. So these are the pledge that I want to make today. If you guys reach out, my newsroom, for example, we will always want it. We will make this change, whether it's for local, regional, or whatever reporting. You know, um, and I don't see this being fought out in, in great thought leadership forums like in Davos in January every year. I haven't seen this as a topic in Davos for 2019. You know, I'll give you one example. Why would a Catholic or equatorial country like Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia want to look at uh, the Arctic base camp research? But without the Arctic base camp research, how do we talk about saving the Earth from global warming? So the Arctic base camp scientists relocated their base for just three days in Davos, completely the same setup, in the snow. They don't stay in hotels. So I need, I implore, and I lobby CAA and MICAS to work together and go Go to each ASEAN countries, for example, make this a point. Even ASEAN Foundation is not talking about this. So my last point is a marriage is only a marriage if all of us put effort into it. And I think we can do a bit more with the lingerie of the data of the <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. As we have only 10 minutes left, I would like to open the floor and to see if any of the audience have questions for the panelists. Um, Maybe you can just stand okay. there and thank you for uh, Thank you for your insights and your enthusiasm for more data and more stories from us. And Vin from uh, a, uh, an, a non governmental organization from the Philippines, I would just like to ask first. Uh, because uh, of the nature of most energy projects and how they get uh, approved, most of these projects take a long time. Uh, and so my, my question would be to uh, how would you advise us CSOs who are willing to work with media to, uh, to report on these stories, uh, how would you advise us to help you uh, stay with these stories for the longest period of time. We understand that there are a lot of things happening in society and we understand that these stories have peaks and troughs and that they don't usually uh, have, uh, are, are they, they are not usually sexy enough to make the 
cover page, but uh, still they are important. And ha there, how would you uh, adv uh, help us help you uh, stay with these stories as they move along? And second, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the projects, for example, energy projects, which have uh, a lot to do with air pollution and air quality, are not. Uh, we begin to. Uh, the story begins without the visual angle because they have yet to be approved. They have yet to be uh, seen by even the uh, even the communities. Uh, how would you suggest that we begin to pitch you these stories so that they will be uh, they will be covered from the beginning, where we can make the most change possible? Uh, I would like to ask uh, my fellow Filipinos, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, if anyone, uh, I mean, anyone shares the enthusiasm to answer and help us cover the stories, then uh, anyone okay. from the panel. So, so what I'm understanding is actually one question that you would want to know that how the media could cooperate with you on energy projects that may cause air pollution issues in your country. Is that correct? Yes, uh, given that some of them have yet to be visualized and given that they take a long time uh, to be approved. Salamat Kabayan, thank you. Uh, uh, actually, it's a difficult question. Um, well, first of all, uh, we are mass media, so very often we have to, we're looking for the lowest common denominator and uh, especially for television, uh, you know, ratings are very important. Therefore, you look you look for the sexy topic. It's very difficult. You're right. I mean, in the beginning of even the most harmful projects, they're never visual. It always starts out with pieces of paper, and it's it's very very difficult to do a story unless you're you organize a thousand people to rally without their clothes on or something in front of the company. I mean, you have to do something like that, no, to make to dramatize the story, you know. I guess my advice to you is not to expect so much from mass media. Uh, and secondly, don't underestimate your own influence. I mean, there's so many people now I meet and they're introduced as you know an influencer, <laughs> social media influencer. I mean, um, I can't imagine at any other time in my, during my career that I have felt less influential. Uh, which is which may not be such a bad thing, because everyone has almost everyone who has access to the internet has become a super empowered individual. Meaning, if you have access to the technology, which everyone almost everyone who has a phone has, then all you need is cleverness. If you have cleverness and you combine it with you know technology that almost anybody else has. You, you can have an audience as, 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 as large as, as mine or any other, I mean seriously, as any other journalist. I mean, I see, people, I see some celebrities on Instagram, they've got millions of followers, um, and they don't, even, they don't even have a TV show. Uh, so, um, I guess uh, you, there's, you, have, you have much more influence than maybe you think. I think people... Uh, think that an issue will only become, uh, or your actions will only have an impact if you somehow make it into the main, mainstream news. Uh, actually, we get news from social media. We get news from, and very often, uh, it's already viral on social media. Everyone already knows about it before we even broadcast it. And sometimes we don't even have to broadcast it because everybody already knows about it. So I don't know if that gives you any hope in what we do, but I think you should have more hope in what you do. Thank you. I would like to weave in in the interest of time. Um, I know this is a domestic marriage Filipino <laughs> but uh, I, I don't subscribe to it, but you know, there's this thing called swingers online and everything. <laughs> so if they don't want to give it to me, uh, because there are, this is the best thing about globalization. I can angle in any story anywhere around the world to make it relevant with a local context. I give you an example. Our colleague just now said that you know, Singapore is the biggest uh, petroleum refinery, but.
But uh, just across the streets uh, in the state of Johor or the peninsula, we're building a sizable amount. It's of 10 to 20 billion US dollars petrochemical refinery complex in Pangaram. What I did was, uh, that was two years ago, it was the third year of the project. The project is about a seven year process been built up. I just went to a fishing village about 10 to 12 kilometers away from that project. And I just sat there for a whole night and morning when the uh, fishing boats came back. I just recorded when they were selling to the middlemen. So a boat with a three crew on it, two day, uh, three days, two nights catch was in Ringgit, Malaysia, 184 Ringgit, 60 cent. That is roughly about 60 US dollars for three days work divided to three people. That's what 20 US dollars each. That's almost going towards the lower part of, of bottom 40%. And that's my point to you. I do not have to wait until the project is okay because the impact is now. That's just the physical income impact. And why? All I need to do to link it, to make a point was, before this project was done, what was your usual catch? They said it was three to five times more. So I didn't say it's because of the project. I just said, hey, how come it has changed? Why are you getting lesser? What else is happening around here? The only big thing that's happening is that one. That's one way. The other way is now we have technology, virtual reality and everything else. If you give us the data from your own findings, we could plot it in and we could have behind the presenter a scenario projection of the future. Imagine 100 hectares of green now, that's going to be 100 hectares of non-green and blah, blah, blah. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, Take what you have and just share because you never know what the other side can make use of it. Yes. Even if the Philippine media, they don't want it, you give it to me, I'll make the parallel because there's a lot of Filipino simulation too. Yes. Um, so we can make use of it. You know, and then we go back there and become viral, for example, because it's viral outside. Yes. I'll give you one other example. Um, I believe it's also the personal crusade of the journalist and editor. I was born in the rice bowl of Malaysia, it's at the border of Thailand, it's called Perlis, a small state. And whenever I was small, I saw this suit coming, raining down on my house. Uh, so I asked my parents where it was coming from, we're not burning anything. It came from 30 kilometers away, there was a sugarcane plantation for sugar. So when they burn the plantation, it travels that far. And from the same place. So I, I'm always finding things to solve, give back to the grassroots. Now they don't, there's no sugar cane, but there's still paddy fields. And whenever they have harvested, the only way until now being done is to burn it. So when you go on this nice highway that Malaysia built for billions of ringgit, then you have to slow down to almost 20 kilometers per hour because you can't see a thing when the wind blows the smoke across the highway. So because that's my interest, so I found a researcher who also had that in mind. He came from the same area. He said, how do we solve this? This is not good, but we also have to take care of the paddy farmers. So now if you, like me, own a Samsung, that device might be in a box that's made from the rice husk from the northern peninsula of Malaysia because his company called Free the Seed under the GCIP program of the UN has managed to find the technology to make waste produce of agriculture, rice or palm oil, into very solid material, accepted by the business supply chain like Samsung, because in the global trade, if you want the industry to be on this crusade with you, you've got to show value to them. So when they use this rice husk or whatever produce, and they can prove the chain because it's all documented, they will be taxed lower because of the lower carbon being used in their supply chain. So you see, just a small story about smoke across the highway from the paddy fields, 
but it can link all the way, which brings me to my friend from China. I'm also compelled to every time find stories like this because about seven or eight years ago, there was this justice index conference in Kuala Lumpur, and when the speaker and presenter from China was showing it on his slide, just like Severino was showing off, um, <laughs> he showed the map of China and real-time data of businesses, factories, who is polluting, who are polluting. They have a real-time index, even then. I was very amazed. That's how I got to know how Foxconn had to move their factories more inland in China because the young people in that factory before were rebelling against because they were using alcohol to clear the screen. And then they, because it took longer to dissipate, then they used powder, which is easier to do, and more focus were getting sick. So I moved to Samsung because of that. It's a conscious call, like walk the talk. I owned a 1985 national car. For me, it was a breakthrough for Malaysia. But I know it's not good for the environment, so I mostly took the train and the buses. So I guess don't give up. We in the media are not that bad. We are also just like you, wanting a better world. Very briefly, um, yeah, I, I tend to agree. Solution stories are a bit more boring <laughs> than the drama that, that uh, 
uh, air pollution uh, brings. But in the Singa talking for the Singapore context, the mainstream media, what always works for a, if you want to guarantee get a story in the national press in Singapore, the, the one that feeds into the national narrative is how great Singapore is. It's a very competitive country, and anything that sells Singapore as the best of whatever, whether that's technology or whatever, will tend to fly. So, so one position, for, for example, if you're selling a story in uh, to, a, to the mainstream media in Singapore that positions Singapore as potentially a leader in air filtration technology or a leader in ways to fight air pollution, it would definitely fly. Would it be a slightly boring story? Possibly, yeah. But Singapore isn't known for particularly interesting stories because not, frankly, a lot happens there. So, so a story that, that is positioned um, <laughs> A solution as, as Singapore winning, I think, would, would work. But that's just my perspective. Yeah, the thing about you know, using uh, things like death to sell a story, how many people died, you know, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, yes, it does make an impact. Uh, but one, I think, I don't, I, I don't think media is deliberately doing it, uh, mostly because media is not doing it on its own. Uh, it's coming out in reports, uh, somebody is uh, making a finding, there are studies, and there are very valid scientific reasons how, I mean, very, very sound scientific methodology to convert, you know, uh, what, how, how many deaths would occur if pollution levels go up, or how many lives can be saved if it goes down. So there are like very, very valid uh, peer-reviewed scientific methodology that goes behind it. And that is what you see in most of the reports coming up, 7.1 million deaths and 4 million. I mean, it's kind of like become numb completely and numbers don't matter. Uh, but then uh, that's how it's reported. And uh, children's uh, health, for example, uh, it's reported again and again. And air pollution is taking the lives of your children. Uh, it's not so much as media is doing, as much as it's coming. I mean, the input that is coming to the media is actually framed in that manner, and that's that's what we are like propagating it forward. Uh, I have some more suggestions. Uh, is you have to know who is the audience, and to write different type of articles. If your audience is a public, you should tell them that the air pollution is uh, harm to your health. You have to wear masks and you have to action pack, action yourself, like a, a, a take a bicycle to a wedding, yeah? And if your audience is a government, tell the government to revise the, the standard and to launch some action, and if your audience is the enterprise, and you have to tell them, you have to uh, uh, um, comply, <coughs> you have to follow the law or your or punish, or there is some money in air pollution, because you, you, you may know there are lots of enterprise exhibition outside. They know they can get money from the air, air pollution and the and the uh, solutions. So uh, it's not difficult to write. It's not the same to write the same stories and same long languages with uh, decide to know who is reading it. I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, the way we, uh, how we can make uh, the story is not boring anymore. I think uh, we have to find a new way to produce uh, news or uh, produce an article. Uh, uh, I have one uh, example in my country. Uh, uh, some media and some NGO, five media and five NGO in Indonesia collaborate and uh, for about two years, they uh, make an investigative and they reveal the corruption uh, of uh, chief uh, police officer in Indonesia. That's I think that's impossible to do uh, if media uh, do uh, uh, do the, the coverage alone. It is it is a bit done because. Uh, Many NGO help, and many expert help, and and it, it, it produces a wow, a wow news. But it, I think uh, it, the key is a collaboration between uh, media because it, I think it's the future way 
how make your work. We cannot uh, work with our uh, uh, our uh, our own media. We have to collaborate between media in Asia or, uh, or globally. I think uh, in green uh, in air pollution, CAA can uh, become our umbrella that we we we, we can uh, network together between uh, media and. Uh, uh, NGO, uh, NGO network between uh, uh, inside this CAA, we can uh, maybe we can uh, prepare to produce uh, some article because uh, may I give you some uh, example also because in Indonesia we have to build so many many uh, power plant, uh, coal power plant uh, about uh, twenty thousand megawatts is all is, uh, uh, coal power plant. The the company which built this uh, power plants from China and Japan, uh, uh, but unfortunately they they built uh, the power plant not using uh, the standard in Japan or Asia with using a, a carbon uh, carbon filter absorbent um, etc etc technology. Uh, I think uh, uh, we can collaborate together. So. Uh, that um, they put uh, power plant in Indonesia power is using a high technology standard and we can push it uh, together between uh, China journalists and Indonesian journalists or maybe uh, uh, Japanese journalists to uh, uh, to make it uh, clean air is uh, implemented well. That's it. Anjong, um, I'm going to differ with you a bit, a bit, just a bit. I'm going to go back to marriages. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hicks, thank you so much. Oh, now you understand why uh, Singapore is the ex-wife of Malaysia. <laughs> Put them out, 1965. They're very boring. Uh, but that's why they have lots of money. Um, you, you know, the answer is right there, in my point of view, in Korea itself. I thought I couldn't take any much more of K-pop. And then BTS came along. Two days ago, the news about BTS, the bad monitor BTS, apart from air quality, <laughs> 500 million downloads on YouTube, speaking at the Nation General Assembly. CAA has not spoken at the Nation General Assembly that I've known of. So, role models don't just look at the negative numbers that. You know, the audience on average, they are very intelligent nowadays. They won't just, oh, stimulus respond. Because there's 7 million deaths, I'm not gonna go out tomorrow. Or I have to have a face mask. They will know, they will Google, they will search. However, I would like to add to that, have made that point. Even in a marriage, they have to be a housewife or a husband that is daydreaming, thinking about somebody else. So we can think about that perfect role model that could inspire us. It used to be Brangelina, you know, perfect couple, now no more. So where is that role model for clean air and air pollution? Who from, you know, CAA or anyone else is the because in order for you to be the legitimate spokesperson, it's not just your rank, it's your believability. And trust now is more and more important that, you know, that trust you have with the audience. Those influencers are there, we might be ridiculing them, but because they have trust. BTS, you now I've been trying to break this BTS enigma, and Jimin or whoever it is, we even know what they think of somebody commenting on their birthday and them trying to help somebody who's trying to kill themselves or whatever it is. Micro content. All or most of your data that comes to us are like <coughs> PhD reports, journals, academic journals. Why can't it also be in micro content, especially that fits the young mind? graphics, colors, animations, and stuff. So I'm gonna defer with you a bit. It's not that your science is not sexy, you're not telling it sexy enough. 
it's not that your wife or husband is not sexy anymore. You have to put on extra sunglasses sometimes <laughs> to see the colors that they have. So that's all I'm going to say today. I'm going to shut up and talk show and talk Thank you. exciting and inspiring discussion around uh, all the panelists. I think they are like, actually for China, we have been working on the air pollution issue for like many years. And I think there are several takeaways that we can share, actually looking for the new angles, because there are other stories and there will be other groups that you can actually introduce to your stories. For instance, like athletes or people are running marathon. Because uh, air is like a very important issue and they can create a lot of works, uh, uh, waves in the social media. And I, I really like to echo what Ikwan had said, because air pollution is not only one city's problem. Because for instance, in China, we're doing in a regional solution. We have to connect all the provinces together in order to solve this problem. And it's the same, I, I think it's the same with regional areas in Asia. And problems happening in Indonesia or in India has some uh, similar reasons, uh, similar courses in, in China, so maybe there will be like more cooperations between media and the journalists in different countries that we can work together and solve this problem together. And I'll give the uh, floor to Robbie. To Thank you. Thanks so much. I just want um, to extend a big thank you to all our journalists who've uh, come from different parts of the world and locally to take part in this. As I said, this is the first time this has happened. So this is very important for us. And personally speaking, as a former journalist for 12 years, uh, it's so nice to actually be back in the company of journalists. So I, I understand the perspective that you're talking from because I came from that perspective. And now I'm also having to negotiate how we get very scientific information and how we do make it sexy, basically. Um, what you've raised, the type of challenges that you raise, the things that, that we actually talk about a lot, and in probably about the last 18 months, we've started working in other countries, working with media. Basically, I th we need to step it up a bit. I think we've been working on the level of capacity building and understanding data. But the challenges and the type of things that you've raised, um, to me, from my perspective as a communications person, it raises the questions to me that we have to broaden this discourse. We have to. We have to open the channels of communications more between the media and the work that we're doing. I think this is a really good start, but I don't think this is the end of the discussion. I think this is something that we need to delve into in greater depth. And I hope that we can find a space to come together again so we can talk in more depth and in gr at greater length about these things as well. Um, Again, thank you very, very much. I, I find you, in, and I know particularly those of us who are uh, working here to communicate the issues that, that we're dealing with, that this has been extremely valuable for us. So thank you again for coming. Thank you for your humour. Thank you for... <laughs> um, uh, thank you for your wisdom and thank you for your insights.